Uh, I would like to welcome all of you to this uh, online education program series. The new board uh, will be announced by our incoming president, Dr. Abbas, uh, soon after I finish my talk. And uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Abbas from Tanzania, who is the new president, and Dr. Hari Krishnayar, who is the president-elect, Mariam Botros, Hamilinda Petroza, Roberto Ancini, who is the vice president, and Bieta from Poland, who is the vice president. So this is the new board, which is going to take over today. Yeah, thank you very much, Vijay. And uh, uh, let's have this uh, series of webinars. And it was it's nice that you have started with Professor Nicholas Sharper, because the next webinars which I'm going to conduct in next uh, two years are going to be from each chapter of each leader, which has already been uh, set up. So up till the end of 2024, we already have it. I'll tell you when I give word of thanks. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. I would like to dedicate this program to one of our regional chairs who passed away, Dr. Sharad Pense, uh, who passed away last week. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a very big honor and pleasure to have here Professor Nicholas Scapper, who is very much well known uh, from every, everyone. And he has been working on the field of diabetic food for many, many years. And uh, also, as we all know, he was the founder and coordinator of the European Diabetic Food Research Consortium, the Eurodial, which is a very, very important uh, work that uh, brought many important um, data to uh, the world of diabetic food. He, um, as scientific secretary, he was one of the founders of GDF, and then he started to be the, uh, from 2015, he started to be the chair of the IWGDF guidance and also chair of the International Symposium on the Diabetic Food that has uh, recently happened in The Hague. So it's a very, very big honor to all of us to close this uh, webinar educational series under the presidency of Dr. Vijay, uh, having Professor Nicholas Scapra leading the presentation of the update of the um, guidelines of the IWGDF, which is a very important mark to all of us who work in this field in order to prevent, treat properly, and also to try to get some better policies to save the feet of the diabetic people. Thank you very much, Professor Nicholas Scapper, to, to be here with us. And uh, I now you can give your very important speech to the award. Thank you very much, um, Linda. And thank you very much, Vijay, for your kind words. I will try to start now my presentation. Um, well, first of all, um, I was very honored to be asked by Vijay because, um, yeah, it's it's your last day as president and Vijay, I always admired your work and I always liked working with you. And why could I say that? Because Vijay was one of the contributors to, this, to these guidelines I'm going to present, highlighting that it's not my work, but it's the work of many and I'm the mere coordinator. And because of that, I'm also with some trepidation, I'm going to give my talk because oh, I think that many of you already know the content uh, either by having contributed to it or you know, having been so long in the field that you're quite up to date. So what Vijay and I discussed beforehand that maybe after my, intro, my talk, which won't be too long, that's a warning, because speak too long, usually speaks too long. So well, I will try to keep it in about 30 minutes and then there's time for question and answering, in particular from the DFOOD perspective about implementation, about quality control, et cetera, et cetera. So there will be, I hope, time in particular about implementation. And finally, um, before I go on, I didn't know that Sherrod Pense passed away and um, I could say that I'm very honored that I could contribute this lecture to his memory. 
because he also was somebody from India I loved working with and admired. Okay, um, so the diabetic food guidelines. Why guidelines? Well, when I started in the area in, in this area uh, in the early 90s, uh, that was a, you know almost 30 years ago, the number of publications was very low. And here you see an overview of PubMed, very simple. I typed in diabetic food and ulcer and a few other keywords. And you see that in the 80s, there were almost no publications. And then it starts slowly rising. And now it is dramatic, rather dramatically increasing. So it's getting more attention, more publication, more data are around there. And of course, we have to acknowledge that still a lot of these data are reviews, people writing up what other people have done, or now there's a new game, the meta-analysis of reviews, um, but still original work is being done and has contributed to our knowledge in the field. And the second problem we have, so this is the rising knowledge base, the second problem we have is that in treating a diabetic foot, it, you should have knowledge and expertise in many different areas. And actually, actually, that was why I like this area so much as somebody who likes to do holistic medicine. And you have to know, you have to have knowledge about orthopedics, about vascular disease, about wound healing, about internal medicine aspects, blah, blah, blah. So you end up with the picture here on the right with this increasing knowledge, here is the poor clinician, which is me maybe, standing in the center and a lot of people are shouting to him, go to the left, go to the right, give that antibiotic, that is bullshit what you're doing, et cetera, et cetera. So we're drowned in information and flooded with information. So to have a con conditions for successful management and prevention of diabetic foot, ulcers and in order to prevent amputation like Vijay said we have to have a common knowledge base it starts there and maybe implicitly but very important is that it's not only knowledge but that we speak the same language when we started this project many years ago we realized that if somebody talks about gangrene people use quite different definitions and criteria so the gangrene of a vascular surgeon is not the gangrene I speak of so we have or even more abstract, what I call peripheral artful diseases, maybe not what somebody involved in wound healing would call peripheral artful disease. So we have to develop a common language from all these different specialities. Then once we know and we can speak the same language, we have to develop a shared sense of urgency and in particular also shared aims. We all know of, that it happens in our teams that you have a radiologist and I'm just I'm not negative about radiologists, but as an example, who said, well, you know, I opened the vessel and it's fine. And he thinks he has done the job, but actually he didn't look after the procedure if there was actually good perfusion of the ulcer area because he was just a plumber involved in opening vessels. And that, of course, is not our aim. Our aim in this situation was to improve perfusion of the ulcer area and even more important to have the ulcer healed and the patient walking again. So we have to have shared aims and we have as teams, we have to develop that. For that, you need a systematic approach. I'm going to highlight that with a few examples. And then of course, it all comes together in a multifactorial uh, team approach, which is not only diagnosis and treatment, but important and prevention and secondary prevention. So it all started uh, under the guidance of Karl Bakker, uh, in 1996, and here you see also a bit the development, how guidelines have been uh, for formulated in the last 30 years. It started, you know, with a bunch of people interested, like me, but not very experts, or experts in the fields. Here you see Andrew Bolton, and you see Jan Appelquist, for instance. And we got together and we said, okay, we're going to write guidelines, and these were a kind of editorial uh, team and they gave us information, and then we read the information, we went through the literature, uh, and we discussed it, and we said, well, okay, it's maybe like this, or maybe like that, and then uh, we wrote it up, and then these guys corrected it, uh, and this was a bit like, uh, we later on, we did it in a bit, bit bigger groups, but the procedure was the same, it's what Fran Game used to call uh, 
consensus by starvation, meaning that Karol Bakker locked us up in a room and said, okay, you have to write a chapter and I throw away the key and you only get lunch at the moment you have the first set of 10 recommendations ready. So that was how we did it. We started with a booklet, uh, which I was responsible for, and then we slowly moved on from uh, interactive CDs to internet, and etc. And with that also, the methodology uh, changed, and we became more and more involved in thinking about a guideline, how to write guidelines. And in the last guideline round, actually, everybody was trained. And in each team, actually, there were two, at least one, usually two guideline methodologists. So we had to follow a whole bunch of trainings in order to, you know, to understand the curtain rule games, which, you know, is getting more difficult and difficult. We have the unique situation that we are an independent organization, so we are not you know, monopolized by the internists or by the vascular surgeons or by whoever. But on the other hand, that's a weakness because we are completely dependent on the support of the industry and who the last set of guidelines were made possible by the firms here on the screen. But please note, they have no influence at all in the guideline formulation, nor did they see the guidelines until it was published. So developing evidence-based guidelines according to the latest quality uh, standards. It's usually now in modern in the modern field, people use the grade approach. And that I'm going to highlight very briefly starts with establishing working groups. We established seven working groups on the different themes I'm going to discuss in a moment. 69, 96 members from 20, 26 countries. And here you can see, you know, everybody uh, who was involved here, and quite a few of you are in this meeting, so I'm, I'm very pleased by that. And that was guided by the editorial board, and the names are here. So that was how we started. Then these different working groups um, were asked to define critical key questions and define the outcomes, the critical important outcomes of these questions. Um, and then these critical questions were sent to external experts and to the editorial board. We reviewed it, we modulated it sometimes a bit, and then the group started working on that and starting to do a systematic review of the, uh, of the literature based on these questions. Then they judged the findings and they rated their quality and then they were able to go from judgment to recommendations and they wrote their recommendations. So here you have a, you know, get a clue of this massive amount of work of the six working groups or seven working groups who did this, seven. So there were more than 120,000 titles and abstracts screened in this last round. There were more than a thousand papers assessed and in the guidelines that resulted in 142 recommendations, 142. Then we had, I already said it, we have the external review process. So it started with involving these external reviewers. Okay, are we on the right track with our questions? And then we you know, gave the final result to them for feedback. And in that we were 119 experts involved from 63 countries. So here you can see the colors, anything which is not gray, there's a country that was involved either in red, member of a working group or in green as an external expert. So we truly try to be, you know, write global guidelines, not just for a specific part of it. Okay, so that is a bit about process. And if there are any questions or comments about that, because there are advantages of this pro process, but there are also risks and disadvantages. We can discuss that later, maybe during the discussion. So the guideline consists of a series of chapters you can see above. The first chapter on the left is um, the practical guidelines, which is a summary of the different uh, guidelines. And I start with prevention because that's where it all starts. And that was identifying and regularly examining the at-risk foot. They, we made us of that group made a series of recommendations about it and schemes. And you, I think you all know this. We have continued with the International Working Group risk score, very low, 
low bottle left and high, and the loss of protective sensation, LOPS, is very central to it. And then you increase your risk when you have peripheral artery disease, artery disease or foot deformities, or you have a history of an ulcer and stage renal disease. And that it's coupled to what we suggest based on consensus, there is no evidence there, on how frequent a patient should be seen at least to examine the foot to detect any changes. And I think we, we all know these data, but this is more for inspiration than it's based on hardcore science. Of course, the characteristics, the risk score, there is some evidence for that. Then the second step, once you identify the patient at risk, you should try to educate the patient and coach him to detect early signs, meaning that implicitly we say, and there has been some debate about that, that we don't want to target the patient not at risk with too much information or too much uh, examinations. So this is only about the patient who is at risk. And if it's a low risk, only loss of protective sensation, uh, you, that's usually that category. We suggest to educate and coach the patient, which in many countries of people who are on this meeting is a problem, not to walk barefoot, to wash and expect their feet daily, to wear appropriate footwear, and when to consult a healthcare professional. And this should be a structural part of your, of your daily care. So the patient knows who and when to consult. In patients with moderate and high risk, we suggest additional activities like consider self-monitoring foot skin temperature once a day. If the temperature is different, more than 2.2 degrees Celsius on two days, we suggest that the patient should reduce embryological activity and consult a healthcare professional. We use consider because the data um, is not very strong, but there are suggestive data that this might uh, might prevent a future ulcer, might prevent the development of ulceration. There is a price to that because recent studies, also some of the older studies, also showed that there is quite a high false positive rate of a temperature difference more than 2.2. So you have to balance that. That might be a few, quite a few patients will have to reduce their ambulatory activity without actually being at risk. On the other hand, it did clearly reduce the development of ulcers in a few studies. Then we have footwear in at-risk patients to prevent ulceration, we all know that. And this is what the prevention worker group uh, suggested. Foot if there is foot deformity in a patient at risk and increased pressure or signs of increased pressure or a pre-ulcerative lesion like a blister, bleeding and hemorrhage and callus, etc. Consider extra depth shoes and the other types, and toe orthosis. For all, each of them, there is evidence for that. But of course, here, equity is a major problem. And in many countries, people don't have access to these kinds of interventions, or at least they have to pay it themselves. And this is not for them doable. But the most important thing then is not to train them not to work barefoot. And this, of course, is uh, something which was already uh, formulated in the 2019 guideline. If you prescribe or if you advise um, a footwear that a patient with a plantar foot ulcer, it, it's not sufficient to say, okay, I think that this kind of intervention, uh, the foot sole or the bar or whatever you have, different interventions, is sufficient to reduce pressure. No, you have to measure it. Otherwise, it's giving people a blood pressure lowering tablet without measuring the blood pressure. And then the blood pressure actually can become too low in certain circumstances, and the patients will have hypotension. And that's actually what we showed in one of our studies, that if you don't measure it, there's a risk that uh, people involved in producing these insoles actually do procedures which increase and not decrease the plantar pressure in certain areas. So you have to know what you're doing. New in this new set of guidelines uh, is treating risk factors and persons at risk, uh, specifically with uh, digital flexor tenotomy in a non-rigid hammer toe with certain signs, uh, 
that there is potential damage and that you can elevate that, as written here on the slide. You should consider in a patient supervised foot ankle exercise programs. There is some evidence that that also might reduce plantar pressure. And again, like earlier on, we suggest not to use nerve decompression to prevent a foot ulcer which many of us seem self-evident, but still in quite a few countries, like my country, this is still propagated as a, as a, as a procedure to prevent ulcer. But there is no evidence at this moment, at least. Once the patient does develop an ulcer, we suggest to, do to, 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 to manage the ulcer very systematically, like I earlier on said in my introduction, um, the multifactorial systemic approach. So it starts with assessing the patient with what, for instance, we suggest you could use SINBAT, site ischemia, neuropathy, bacterial infection, area and depth. With site, you could say, okay, is it the plantar ulcer or is it the dorsolateral toe ulcer? Because these sites will differ in treatment. Of course, you have ischemia, so you have to, it's, you can have ischemia. So you have to not only examine the pulses, but also with a Doppler, uh, examine the pedal waveforms, measure the ankle and toe pressures, and then also calculate the ankle brachial and tibial brachial index, ABI, TBI. And the TBI is new that we added that. We can maybe discuss it later because this clearly has impact on accessibility and costs. Then with neuropathy, the 10 gram monofilament, if absent, the Ipswich touch test. We all know that, I think. With bacterial infection, we suggest to classify the infection if it's present according to the International Working Group Diabetic Foot Criteria with or without osteomyelitis. So that has to be answered for each patient. And then you have small ulcers and larger ulcers with the cutoff shown here. And then you have uh, the, the depth of the ulcer, and we suggest that in each ulcer, the depth of the ulcer should be evaluated with a probe to bone test. And we usually say, okay, you have a superficial ulcer or a deep ulcer with or without probe to bone. Because for instance, a deep ulcer with signs of infection, even if the skin is only mildly affected, will by definition be a moderate infection at least. So there you see combinations. If the patient has possibly osteomyelitis, and of course it very much depends on the population you studied, but you know um, prevalence rates of around 20, 25% in particular in ulcers that are have a longer duration have clearly been reported. So the osteomyelitis is likely when you have positive probe to bone test, you have a marked increase in inflammatory markers. You can find in a guidelines certain cutoff points, but be careful if somebody has an ESR of 55 and the cutoff point is 60, you can't of course say, oh, that's not a marker for osteomyelitis, that it's still likely. In particular, if you combine that with a probe to bone test and an abnormal X-ray. So it's a combination of tests. But when you remain in doubt, the group, working group advice to perform an MRI. And if that's not possible for many reasons for that, you can use radionucleotide scanning as an alternative. And that will be discussed more in depth, I think, when we have this DFOOT session specifically on this topic. If you have a moderate and severe infection, you should always obtain tissue specimen for culture, tissue, so not a superficial swab. And if there is osteomyelitis, preferably a bone biopsy for histology to be certain about the diagnosis and culture and preferably done percutaneously. So not through the ulcer, but through the unaffected skin or during operation, if you do an operation. So that brings me to treatment. Unaffected treatment, do not treat with antibiotics and do not try to prevent Infection with local treatments, with mild infections, if it's if you're living in, in not in human, very humid conditions, it should be antibiotics targeted to gram positives for 
rather briefly short courses, one or two weeks. Moderate affection, initial broad spectrum antibiotics. There are a whole bunch of antibiotics uh, you could choose from. But the funny thing is, if you look at all these trials, they all seem equivalent. So try to use the smallest broad spectrum antibiotic. Seems a bit contradictory to what I'm saying. So don't go to the very modern, very extremely broad spectrum because it's the usual suspects which are there, unless specific circumstances. And then tailor based on your culture. So after two or three days, you can already start narrowing down your antibiotics as part of antibiotic stewardship to prevent the development of resistance. In my hospital setting, uh, I introduced an, an, uh, in, in the early 90s an, um, a scheme which included a third generation uh, cephalosporin. Now I would say with insight, that was much too broad, ceftacidim. The firm was very happy because a lot of other hospitals took it over. And subsequently, 10 years later, we had a lot of ceftacidim uh, resistance. Clearly, I think, tem at least temporarily related to the introduction of ceftacidim because we were the ones using it mostly in diabetic foot infections. So you do have impact on the ecology of your in your surrounding by the antibiotics you choose. Severe infections, well, that's simple. Treat it as a life-threatening sepsis. It's not about saving the leg, but it's about saving the patient. And there are usually local protocols for that. And in any moderate or severe infection, apart from the antibiotic question, which antibiotics and how long and which mode, IV, oral, you should always ask the question, is emergency surgery indicated? And if there's any doubt, a surgeon should be consulted or at least somebody with surgical experience. Because if there is a deep foot infection and a compartment is affected, I don't have to tell that probably to most of you, then you should try to open it as quickly as possible um, and to, to relieve the pressure in, the, in, in that compartment and to remove most of the dead tissue. And don't wait with other diagnostics until you have those. No, the surgery comes first. Time is tissue. Osteomyelitis, I refer that for the guidelines, but in summary, if there is no exposed, exposed bone or no need for incision and drainage, antibiotics without surgery for six weeks. There are some studies going on that you it might be even shorter, but at this stage, I think it's six weeks, which we advise. If you have minor amputation with a positive bone margin culture, which in my hospital was new because the surgeon didn't do that. So you do a minor amputation and you, there are still residual bacteria in the bone that is left in situ, antibiotics uh, for three weeks after the amputation. And um, follow up at least six months to ascertain remission. So it's not just simply sending the patient home and say goodbye. No, because there is a relatively high relapse rate. Now we go to peripheral arterial disease. So you have a patient with an ulcer or a gangrene. You should always palpate the pulses and, and examine for signs of ischemia. And you should always do pedal Doppler waveforms, ABI, TBI to diagnose and importantly also to exclude PAD because um, the prevalence of PAD is around 50%. So one in two, at least in medium and high income countries and also in the low income countries, the prevalence is rising. Then you should use Wi-Fi to stratify healing likelihood and amputation risk. I will comment to that in a moment. And then based on Wi-Fi and based on the pulses, and the pressure measurement, you can decide what to do. So you have, if you have very low ABI or the other measures, it's down on the left side, you should do emergency consultation of a vascular surgeon and probably emergency and revascularization procedure. If you have absent pulses and with the intermediate values, you see that in the middle, you should think about uh, revascularization, so consult a vascular specialist, unless because of the infection, an urgent amputation is indicated. Then, of course, you should always do the amputation first, but as limited as possible. And then maybe you can say, okay, do we have to do an, an additional revascularization procedure? 
And if there is peripheral arterial disease with infection or going green, always consult a vascular specialist. So that's that's also based on Wi-Fi risk scores. So if a patient has signs of peripheral arterial disease and he has signs of infection, you should always consider a revascularization. But that is partly also based on the Eurodial study. If the values are normal and you have initially little suspicion of peripheral arterial disease, you should treat the patient with standard of care, best standard of care, treat infection as best as can. But if there is no healing for about you know, four weeks, reassess, repeat uh, some of the measurements. What about uh, the Wi-Fi? Well, the Wi-Fi includes wound characteristics or the amount of tissue loss, the infection severity, according to you know, our criteria, and the perfusion deficit measured either by one of these on the screen. And then based on that, you can create a risk score for uh, amputation risk and uh, revascularization benefit. The evidence for this is not very strong, but the evidence is there showing in studies that um, you can predict um, the outcome of the, the ulcer and maybe um, also the benefit of revascularization. And most importantly, I think for me, Wi-Fi helps to structure your thinking and start a discussion in your team. And you could use an app for that. Here's an, a simple example. You can download it from the internet. And actually, one of the great things I, I thought when Wi-Fi was introduced was suddenly all my vascular surgeons were interested in the International Working Group infection score because Wi-Fi forced them to look and classify infection. And they were forced to look at wound characteristics. And before that, everybody was only looking at the perfusion deficit. So that's very good for the team discussions. The treatment, if you have a person with diabetes and you think that a revascularization is indicated, well, this is of course not new to everybody, but uh, oops, I have a problem here. Give me a second. Um, so here we were. Um, so <clears throat> at least, when in my team, when we have a, an interventional radiologist not very trained in a diabetic foot, frequently they stopped examining the arteries above the ankle. So you have to train everybody involved in radiology when they do a DSA to 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 have a complete visualization all up to the to the toes. Then you have to assess the like <laughs> David was already alluding to the great Savinus Fien GSV for suitability for bypass. That's new. Um, and to see if, 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 if a, su a suitable vein is present in, when you think that an intervention is needed. And if indeed the vein is suitable, um, our advice at this moment is based on, on mostly one study, high quality New England Journal of Medicine, although that doesn't always say that it means high quality, but the study was very well performed and very few studies in this area. Then we say, okay, consider, because it's only one study, we don't make it a strong recommendation, but consider doing a bypass procedure, which might change a bit of the way people are being working because more and more people are just simply relying only on endo, which is runs a risk then because if you have, we think in particular, a large perfusion deficit, a lot of tissue loss, and you have a suitable vein, we suggest think about uh, a bypass. If you have not um, a suitable vein, like the GSV, uh, then the results suggest that either endo or open is equal. And then probably many centers would choose for endo, but even open is okay. If the patient is deemed unfit for a bypass, or if you, when you do your DSA, you see, hey, this is something which is a straightforward endo procedure. Of course, you can do immediately an endo procedure. But then you should try to target the artery, um, supplying the angiosome associated with the ulcer. And Gangrene, I alluded to that earlier, that you should improve the area where the ulcer is. 
And in particular, some people would choose for an endo procedure, even if the if a, if, if a suitable GSV is, is present in a patient who is severely ill, you need an urgent revascularization and you don't have the time for a complete workup. But in mo many patients, I think you can at least consider um, a bypass. That's vascular, that's peripheral artery disease. I won't go into that into details because I was asked to give you an overview. And then of course, this is a slide I borrowed from Sickle Bus uh, and uh, Pete Lazaridi, it's about overloading. And um, the background is of course, you have this plantar ulcer and then you have a whole bunch of different interventions. Um, the fields is getting rather clouded with all these different kinds of, uh, of offloading devices. And then you can either have a happy foot or an unhappy foot. So we have to make choices. And this is a scheme which was developed four years ago and is now slightly adapted. And I think it's a beautiful scheme, but the disadvantage is there is so much info that maybe it's difficult to share via uh, the Zoom meeting, but of course I advise you to hang this up in your um, department so everybody can see it. And that's why we made it like this. You have a person with a non-plantar ulcer, a plantar forefoot ulcer, a midfoot ulcer, or a plantar heel ulcer. That's the first division you should think about. If it's non-plantar, then you can usually use a non a, a removable offload device, toe spacious, orthosis, etc. Or you could do a digital flexor tonotomy, like it was already discussed with the um, with the prevention. If you have a plantar ulcer, is infection or ischemia present? Next question. Or is no infection or ischemia present? Well, if no ischemia is present, then you suggest, we suggest, the group suggests to use a non-removable knee high offloading device. If not uh, possible, not contra, if contracated or not tolerated, you go down this way on the right side. If there is infection or ischemia, and it's either mild or mild ischemia, uh, or uh, then you should consider, uh, uh, still you can consider an, a knee-high offloading device, but the more infection you have or the more ischemia you have, um, the more you should be careful using a uh, non-removable, but probably you should use a removable knee-high device, which is here. Uh, and then even that, that's what we do in our center. We make it based on, on you know, the total contact cast approach David Armstrong developed. We use a non uh, a removal device made partly non removable, and then the nurse visits the patient, and each time she removes the wraps and applies them again. So we can still each day evaluate the ulcer, but still there is a knee high device which the patient can't take off. In other situations, you could use other types of devices, but I think it's the met the, the philosophy behind it which is important. And if you have a plantar uh, heel ulcer, consider using a non-removable knee-high offloading device. And in each of these situations, if the ulcer fails to heal, um, you can have you could consider Achilles tendon lengthening with a metatarsal head ulcer, but that also has risks. But that's described in the guideline. Or you could do a section, or you could do an osteotomy, um, or you could do a joint arthroplasty but I suggest you read those details. So this is the scheme, which I think would help you guide making choices and explain to the patients where you are. Wound healing, the next chapter. Well, there are a lot of recommendations there. So Fran, I apologize, I apologize but I only took out a few, which I thought were important. Do not routinely use enzymatic debridement instead of sharp debridement. So sharp debridement is the key. But if you, for reasons it's not possible to do sharp debridement, then you could use as a second alternative enzymatic debridements. If the ulcer is not responding to standard of care, only then consider the following, the sucralocti sulfate, we all know that, for neuroischemic ulcers, the, the patch, uh, but that requires a re repeated venipuncture. Uh, so that should also be possible. The topical oxygen, which is a new player in the field, and there are some studies suggesting that it does speed up wound healing, 
or in the hyperbaric oxygen. Always, you know, good for discussion uh, about should we do it or should we not do it. But the group decided based on the evidence that yes, there is evidence that hyperbaric oxygen does prevent amputation. But of course it has a price tag and it has certain disadvantages. And then there are placental derived products, which in se there are several of them, uh, which have shown to be effective. And then consider negative wound pressure therapy, specifically in post-surgical wounds. The final uh, chapter is a new one, which is about charcoal. Uh, we defined charcoal as an active charcoal neural osteoarthropathy, CNO, as a red worm swallowed food with osseous abnormalities on imaging. So you have to have signs of inflammation and you have to have osteoabnormalities, which also includes the joints. Remission is the absence of inflammation, with or without deformity, secondary to the CNO, and with radiological consolidation of fractures. So we don't talk anymore, and we advise not to use the term the shark of foot, because that confuses, at least for me, uh, the discussion very much, because for many people, the Charcot foot is the typical collapse of the midfoot. So that's a Charcot in remission. Well, for other people, the Charcot foot also includes the active Charcot. So remission is no inflammation and consolidation. And then we have this specific stage zero, active Charcot, where there are clinical signs of active CNO, and you have the normal X-rays, but then if you do subsequent uh, examinations like an MRI, you could also use radionucleotide, you have demonstrable osteoabnormalities and you have bone marrow edema. That then is called a stage zero, so without a fracture. Or if you specifically do in those situations a CT scan uh, of the foot in high resolution, you usually find uh, microfractures. And here is a scheme we try to supply everybody with schemes. They can hang out in different areas of their hospital uh, of how to treat the patients. If you have clinical suspicion, I already mentioned it, do an X-ray, preferable weight bearing, so while standing on the foot, because then you can see the deformities that are developing easier. If it's negative, do an MRI, first choice, second choice, uh, CT with or without in combination with scintigraphy. And in the meantime, while you're waiting for the MRI or the CT scan, you should always put the patient in a non-removable knee-high device because the fracture can develop, can progress rapidly with the development of deformities. If the X-ray is positive or if the secondary visualizations with MRI, CT, et cetera, are positive, then the patient has an active Charcot and you should treat the patient with a non-removable knee-high cast until clinical remission. That is important, I think, uh, detail uh, where the devil is, because for instance, uh, Fran, you showed in your uh, English uh, observational data tr um, collection about charcoal that many people, many, maybe not many, but too many persons probably go out of the cast before they're completely in remission, although, we don't know for sure, but I, if I look at the literature, I have that, that, that impression because it frequently takes nine months. And I have even experienced in one patient with 14 months of knee high casting. And of course that is horrible for the patient. Uh, and that results in such a huge loss of quality of life. But on the other hand, we talk about deformity prevention. So you have to keep motivating the patient, support them, uh, and sometimes even help with the financial consequences of this kind of therapy. We also advise assistive devices, crutches, elbow high, and we advise uh, to look at the vitamin D status according to your local guidelines and prescribe vitamin D if the patient according to your local uh, guidelines. Because patients with diabetes are at an increased risk of having vitamin D insufficiency. Everything you can find in our guidelines here, the different chapters summarized in the practical guidelines, uh, and down is the methodology we followed. Uh, 
you can look either at the um, at our website, which is uh, here down below, or you can look in the uh, if you go to PubMed Diabetes Metabolic Research and Reviews 2023. Nearly all the guidelines are now there, except the um, the uh, infection guidelines and the peripheral artery disease guidelines, because that's unique for this time. Uh, they are produced in parallel with other organizations. So the peripheral artery disease together with the European Association of Vascular Surgeons and the American uh, Vascular Surgeons and the um, infection guidelines together with the American, with the ITSA. Uh, and they're also going to be published in their journals. So we hope to improve implementation there. So they are both now approved by the different, uh, by all these organizations. So um, we are the final stage of putting them on the, um, on the, uh, in the DMMR within the next few days. I have to finish with thanking so many people, because if you look at the numbers, we had 150 online meetings, quite horrible. We had that resulted with all the screening and all these meetings in more than 10 years of full-time work by all these different persons. So it was a huge undertaking. And I have to thank everybody who was involved in this work. Thank you, Professor Nicholas Schapper, for not only this fantastic lecture, but also guiding us through the IWGDF guidance all these years from 2015. Uh, so I think uh, it's a real game changer and it's truly an international guideline. And we thank you for extending your full support for this IWGDF guideline. Yeah, I would like to thank the speaker, Professor Nicholas Schaper from the Netherlands, who took his time in a, from his busy schedule and ex, a, 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 accepted the invitation to talk and give a very nice lecture on this important issue. He almost covered the whole international consensus guideline in 30 to 35 minutes. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Nicholas. I can assure you that the next eight webinars planned in next two years by New World are on the basis of chapters of international consensus on diabetic food and will be delivered by the leader or a member of that chapter starting from high risk for peripheral neuropathy, arterial disease, infections, wound healing, classification, offloading, charcoal, and prevention. So that will be a good implementation and dissemina dissemination of the uh, consensus, international consensus, and obviously it will go on cascading effect. I would like also to thank to all the panelists, and it was a really a good discussion uh, all the board members of DFOOT International, regional chairs, regional advisor of DFOOT International for hard working to get this program running smoothly and globally. Special thanks to the core team of Diabetic Food Webinar Education Program for Secretariat IT service provided by personnel in the Office of President, especially Sarva Kumar. And finally, I would also like to thank all the delegates. Up till now, we can see there are almost 190, it had reached to 200. Without them, no webinars are possible or any conference possible to be successful. So a very big thank to all of you from the bottom of our left ventricle. Thank you very much. Thank you very Vijay. much. Yeah, thank you, Professor Chappell. Uh, I'm sure DFOOT International will work very closely with IWGDF in the months to come, weeks to come. And we have a special MOU agreement with as you heard from Linda with IDF now, and with uh, the International Association of Diabetic Food Surgeons. And we have an agreement with many other organizations. So we look forward to working with the IWGDF in the months to come. Thank you very much. <laughs>